tripolarity and, 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 and make the argument that these powers, these big three, if you will, uh, um, uh, actually have established some years back a triangular relationship. And ex it explains a lot of what goes on in regional and global politics. It's often hidden from view, and this is a, a model, a framework, if you will, that it, frankly is dismissed in our, in our country, and particularly in American international relations scholarship in the academy. But you step outside our borders to other parts of the world, um, uh, aspects of this model, elements of it are alive as well. And so basically, I, I kind of dust off uh, the triangularity framework, the thesis, and apply it uh, across time, if you will. And I argue here that, uh, that the main premise is that contemporary international affairs are increasingly driven by the prevalence of pressing regional conflicts where at least two of these big three uh, maintain divergent interests or support competing regional actors. Uh, and and uh, this model is borne out I believe in uh, conflict situations involving Iran, North Korea, Syria, even U Ukraine. Uh, uh, and you, you will see that there is, a, if you will, a, a pattern to Rus Russian-U.S. Chinese relations. And, and essentially the three are tuned to each other and a lot of what they do, even if it involves a Syria, a North Korea, a Pakistan, it, 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 it's attuned to those other actors in, in the triangle. So that's what this is about, in, in, a, in a nutshell. The triangularity uh, thesis. This project is a long time in coming. I became uh, really interested in triangularity about uh, going on 20 years ago now and produced some conference papers, shopped those around in different journals. It didn't do very well. Uh, uh, the, the criticisms were scathing. I, I've saved them. Uh, I've dusted them off. Uh, uh, they were really, really humbling. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, so this has gone through the fire. And actually, when I produced the first uh, draft of the manuscript last summer, I believe it was, sent it to the publisher. They send them out to reviewers. Oh boy, the reviews, the blind reviews were scathing. It was really humbling. And it's interesting, the, the reviewer uh, uh, said that, well, you know, you're, you're giving Russia too much shrift. You know, Russia's not that important anymore, it's too weak. Uh, you, you're better off plugging Japan into your model, or Germany, than Russia. And really, really uh, strong criticisms. And so after I kind of got over, you know, the depression, <laughs> you know, it lasted about a week or so, I began to you know, really look at those comments and tweak some things, adjust some things, but send it back to the publisher and say, hey, I'm, I'm standing my ground here. Uh, I, this, I, if, if you're going to work with me on this, uh, the, the framework has to stay intact. Uh, yes, Russia's a very, it's a wounded bear in many ways, but it's still a bear, and it, and it has some of the things, and uh, if you corner a bear, uh, you're, you're, you're going to have some, some issues. So uh, I don't even think they sent it back out to the reviewer, which was, which was fine. So uh, here, 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 here we are now with authority, ascendancy, uh, and supremacy. So, colleagues, um, I, I see two constants, if you will, in global politics after the Cold War especially. Uh, one, that these three, uh, at least two of the so-called big three, China, Russia, and United States, are pretty much on or near the scene every time there's a crisis, every time something erupts. Uh, uh, President Obama appeared to be pretty close uh, on taking a military action against Syria, but it was a deal with Russia that China backed, you know, from behind the curtains, if you will, that forestalled uh, some kind of attack with Syria. Uh, so some of this stuff um, take, develops in secret. Uh, but, the, the, if you will, these big three are there, they are present, if you will. Another constant that I see is, uh, again, a functioning, almost axes. If you're talking about a triangle, there are three axes, right? Well, there, this thing functions. And, uh, and I spend a lot of time, in each of the chapters of the book has a, uh, a preceding quote or something. And it's amazing how President Obama speaks to China. 
okay? Sometimes in nice terms, sometimes in tough terms. Uh, Putin speaks, uh, uh, in fact, one, one great quotable from Putin here is that unipolarity will not work. And so what he does, he essentially in this statement, he not only trashes what he sees as U.S. strategy and policy, but all these Western scholars that talk about it's a unipolar world, trash yourselves. So I have these interesting quotes from leaders, people from different corners, who are speaking to aspects of the Trump angle, speaking to the different axes and, and that sort of thing. And the, and the most recent uh, uh, statement from our side that really has the Chinese uh, 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 concern is that the U.S. is an Asian power, and essentially we're going to be in Asia forever. So. Um, um, there, there is something, if you will, to this triangular, triangularity. Now, um, the, the triangle, if you will, and in the book I, I uh, provide more discussion uh, of, the, of these different dynamics, there's more detail. Well, you, if we look here, where I'm pointing the, uh, uh, the, the cursor, this is contemporary Central Asia. So this is one of the theaters, if you will, one of the regions where this fifth play. The larger circles will be, obviously, the big three. Uh, the circles are not uh, uh, all the same size. And so the, the actor, this is good old-fashioned realism, if you will, power politics. The, the, the strongest or most powerful actor will be represented uh, with the, the largest circle. And that's just so to... To, to make the point here, because that while there, these are the great powers, there are some that are greater than others, if you will. The letter M over the country um, represents a military role or a military presence in the region. And then again, that's just so that the readers you can identify. And then obviously, uh, uh, you know, if two actors are closer together of the big three, with a solid line, that denotes friendship. That denotes friendship. Uh, and if the, if the arrow is broken, that's to denote a chilly relationship, a conflict, conflict-ridden relationship, even a hostile relationship. And in most cases, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the U.S.-China and U.S.-Russia axes will have broken lines, will be farther apart. So we, the United States, we are the odd man out in the triangle for the most part. That wasn't the case years ago during the Nixon era, the Cold War when this ensued, but it definitely is the case now. Then you'll see, uh, um, uh, and I never claim to be an artist, but you have other <laughs> actors, if, if you will. You've got the stands here. And notice that the stands, the, the former Central Asian and uh, former republics, are situated near Russia and or China. And so um, um, we don't use this terminology anymore in IR literature, but the orbits are such that the certain countries orbit in a certain way. And Vladimir Putin is very happy uh, with that, that, kind of, that kind of arrangement for the former Soviet Republic. <coughs> SCO is a Shanghai cooperation uh, organization. If there ever will be a Russian slash Chinese counterpart to NATO, it will be the SCO. Uh, the SCO um, uh, gets a lot of attention, uh, you know, from U.S. strategists and even people in Congress who, who believe that Russia and China are either in an alliance or headed towards a, an anti-Western alliance, if you will. You'll see, I, you, you'll see I have Iran closer to Russia and China because they, that, that's a very important partnership to the chagrin of Western powers in the United States. India, Turkey sits in the middle, uh, or at least uh, uh, somewhere between, if you will, the East and the West. And so the Central Asia complex or triangle looks sort of like this. And then, of course, things shift a bit. And you'll notice uh, uh, the actors are of a, of a, a larger or closer, the big three closer to, uh, in size, more similar in size. Each still has a military commitment. And obviously, you see North Korea tucked down there between China and Russia. It's in, it's in that orbit. And then you notice here, uh, you see uh, international, international organizations or intergovernmental organizations, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, APEC, and, and, uh, and so you see we have these IGOs involved as well. And, uh, and so 
you'll notice then that the big three are closer in size in the Asia Pacific complex or theater, if you will. You'll notice other actors there. Uh, and you'll notice, again, Russia and China are, at least in friendship, uh, U.S. even further apart and uh, uh, with, with the, the broken lines, if you will, uh, from Russia and China. So, again, broadly stated, colleagues, the strategic triangle, um, um, what it tries to do is to capture the nature, distance of relationships within the triangle. So there is a symmetry of actors, three key actors. There um, are three core activities, conflict, cooperation, and competition, broadly stated. So what, what can you do as an actor in the triangle? And even, even those third powers, they, they, they take a conflict path, a competition path, a, a, a cooperation path. And the actors do all of these. Sometimes they do them at the same time. Uh, Russia and China, as friendly as they are with each other, they also have uh, areas of divergence, serious divergence and mistrust. And so sometimes they're actually competing with each other while they're cooperating with each other against the United States, principally. So there are these core activities, conflict, cooperation, and competition. And there are the core concepts, and that's from the title of the book authority, ascendancy, and supremacy. Uh, a power is an authority, and I had to really uh, uh, search around on this one and, and, and look at the thesaurus and dictionary carefully. But if you are an authority, you have jurisdiction. So that something that happens in your yard, okay, uh, it, it happens because you allow it to happen. Uh, um, uh, Vladimir Putin does not want to allow Ukraine to be fit for NATO. So why not uh, break away the Crimea, this, this member of the country? And so uh, uh, Russia uh, insists on being a, an authority, and even better, a hegemon in its, in its backyard. So in the triangle, in the system, um, you are either uh, an authority, depending on the, the other uh, variables, the realities, you are Obviously, uh, you could be uh, ascendant, if you will, and broadly stated, that's an actor that seeks to change the status quo. Okay? And for the most part, uh, uh, of the three, China is more the ascendant power, although in some areas it's really reached uh, what some would say supremacy status. And then, of course, the supreme power is dominant. Uh, uh, he does what he wants to do for the most part. Uh, and he even uh, has hegemonic uh, de designs. There are others, colleagues, who have grappled with aspects of triangularity. Even some um, uh, scholars you'll know or know of, like Fareed Zakaria, uh, Zygmunt Brzezinski, and some of these um, um, actors, uh, some of these colleagues, they uh, play with regional designs and setups, uh, if you will. And it's really, really, really interesting the way, way of looking at um, global and regional politics. Now, my, my favorite chapter, I think, in the, in the whole book is the history chapter. Uh, uh, it seemed that that was the one that took me the longest to, to write, and I, I love history. And so I uh, went all the way back to the, sort of the formation of the Soviet Union, the Bolshevik Revolution, or coup, uh, and found some interesting things. And I think some of the, the, the best insights come from that chapter. Uh, first, uh, Richard Nixon and his buddy Henry Kissinger deserve a lot of credit, and they get a lot of credit, don't they, for the formation of the strategic triangle. You know, Nixon's opening to China, uh, did deals with the Russians and deals with the Chinese. And of course, Nixon took uh, advantage of the fallout that happened between the Soviets and the Chinese, and so the, 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 the divorce, if you will. Um, and, um, and he was very adept, he was a good realist at playing off uh, the enemies against each other, and even making deals with the enemies um, um, uh, and, and, and to help keep them from making up again, if you will. But Nixon gets a bit too much credit, I think. Um, uh, I believe, and I think this is one of the contributions of the study, that the, uh, the formation or the, the evolution of the strategic triangle actually ensues before Nixon even comes to office in the late 60s. 
Uh, right after, and I believe that the, the time period here is the Cuban Missile Crisis. We all have some recollection, or at least we have heard about it. 1962, fall 1962. Not even a year later, um, uh, the Americans were pushing the uh, 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 non-proliferation. And the non-proliferation treaty, or NPT, was actually uh, uh, signed off on in 1963. Now, this doesn't receive a lot of attention in the literature, but there is a record there. And this drove the Chinese nuts. Uh, uh, the, the Chinese perspective uh, on these things were, first of all, the Soviets backed down in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was a humiliation for world communism. And of course, Khrushchev was deposed uh, a year later in 1964. Well, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty Regime, seemed to be the icing on the cake for the Chinese. Uh, it, uh, and and, and, and in their perspective, this was a this was a typical Western agreement to get uh, enemies or potential enemies kind of tied up in agreements and regimes. You know, in other words, to curb China's military growth, particularly the nuclear realm. So that was the Chinese perception of the NPT. And then, worse for Mao Chinese leaders was that the Soviets signed off on it, which again would put China in a tough position. Well, you know, we got to sign off on it too. And so uh, it, it, it's this interesting context, and, and if you followed any of this, and even before Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the dispute between uh, the Chinese and the Soviets had already become public. And so um, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty much on the way, if you will, this big Sino-Soviet split. Uh, Nixon, again, took great advantage of it in that way. There's something else uh, that, uh, and again, if you dig enough, you'll, you'll find references in the literature, but um, there, uh, there appeared to be real concern and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, among Chinese leaders and, and leaders and scholars and strategists throughout Asia. And that is that uh, Western racism, particularly American racism, and the racism of Russian leaders and strategists uh, and communiques and discussions uh, um, uh, really um, uh, cemented for the Chinese the idea that we need to be on our own in world politics. And, uh, and I cite in this, in this chapter quotes from different authors, Western and non-Western uh, observers, uh, about this particular element. And so the Chinese felt uh, terribly isolated. And Richard Nixon, of course, he was quite a quotable person. And he, 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 you know, he, he threw racial epithets at any number of groups, from Indians to Jews. And, and so um, uh, it seems that some of this discourse, and some of it which was secret at the time, at least uh, uh, not in the public media, it, it, it prompted the Chinese to step out on their own, if, if you will. So. Uh, we move on uh, through time, and uh, we have major events like the invasion of Afghanistan and, and the Reagan Revolution, you know, moving into the 80s. Well, it's Mik Mikhail Gorbachev uh, who comes along in the mid-late 80s, and he, colleagues, was actually the only leader in the triangle among the big three who really took steps unilaterally to break out of this triangularity which was increasingly really strangling, placing a stranglehold on uh, uh, regional and global politics. And so Gorbachev's moves kind of pushed things along, and uh, uh, you, you know the story, basically. He was, you know, uh, kidnapped, it was a coup attempt, and some months later, you know, he's out of office, the Soviet Union uh, has collapsed. But interestingly, the triangle endures. You have some in the academy and observers who argue that the triangle died with the Cold War. Some will even argue that bi the bipolar Cold War system, this two-block system, died with the or was dying after the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, but this triangle has endured, even persisted. It, it, ha it hasn't died. Uh, what, what has happened, and this is, this is clear to see, is that the axes are hardening, if you will. And others among the so-called rising rest, the Brazils, the Venezuela, the Irans, uh, the uh, Taiwans, uh, are also 
becoming more and more adept at playing the triangular politics, if, if you will. So this hasn't gone away, uh, despite the fact that uh, the, the academy, particularly in, in our country, does not pay much attention. It dismisses uh, a triangularity, if you will. So as we move into our time, if you will, uh, we, we live in a world now that's, uh, that can be, I describe as immensely chaotic. It seems we go from crisis to crisis, domestic, regional crises. Sometimes the crises overlap, right? Sometimes they, uh, they, they'll start here. Uh, it even has more of my students uh, thinking in conspiracy terms. We, we, we really, we insist, don't do that, don't go there. But they say, how can all these weird things not be connected in some way? <laughs> so, um, um, it, immensely chaotic, many, many things that are, many developments that are very, very difficult to explain. There is, however, a newer or an emerging pivot in, in global affairs, and it appears that, uh, if you will, Eurasia, all the way east into East Asia, south Indian Ocean, into uh, Northern Africa particularly, that uh, this has become the new pivot for conflict, co cooperation, and competition, if, if you will. Um, economic insecurity, e energy security issues, internal and regional instabilities of all manner, and even the physical realm, the environmental realm. Um, um, you know, the, the, these are some, if you will, issue areas that have come to the surface. But again, the triangle endures. The triangular politics uh, is uh, alive and well. It, it's at play. In the middle of the book, beginning in the fifth chapter, I begin uh, to uh, kind of ferret out uh, and discuss uh, the, the interests and objectives of my big three, if you will. So really quickly, in terms of China's interests and objectives, uh, Jonathan Pollock calls China, uh, China a candidate superpower because there's this debate about China's rise. You know, where, how strong is it? Where, what is it? Where is it right now? Uh, Bates Gill, Canadian author, calls China a global power center. A global power center. For the most part, colleagues, China is principally either an ascending or ascendant or authority power. As best as as as, um, as as many can catch these things. However, China requires a multipolar world. Uh, requires a multipolar world. At the same time, China demands to be the hegemon of the region. So China insists, and it will counter U.S. power in East Asia in in, in its in its space, if you will. And it will outpace Japan and India, particularly. And so if you talk about what's, what are China's principal concerns, it's being the biggest guy in its, in, in its space, not sharing the space with the USA. So when President Obama makes a comment, like, we are an Asian power, or we announce that we're going to dispatch a few Marines down under, if you will, uh, uh, it, it gets Chinese attention. And so... Uh, China requires regional and domestic stability. In fact, uh, uh, its domestic stability is listed as a foreign policy objective. And, and so uh, they, um, they're not even happy, China, about this uh, dismemberment of Ukraine. Because China, of course, has its own uh, internal issues, Uyghurs, Muslims to the West, uh, others uh, who maybe want more religious freedom. And so uh, China requires and insists on domestic and regional instability. It requires energy security. Uh, China and India are two of the world's uh, top produce, uh, consumers of, of energy, as we know. And China practices a very pragmatic, goal-oriented foreign policy. And they work very hard to avoid confrontations, Chinese and Chinese leaders. This frustrates the American counterparts particularly when we declare we want a, a stronger stance on Sudan or you know, other uh, Chinese partners, if you will. China is in a strategic partnership with Russia. Um, more observers are, are saying, no, it's not a partnership, it's actually an alliance. It's actually an, an alliance. 
and if it and, and uh, whatever it is, they very definitely use the strategic triangle to maintain influence um, with each other, but also with uh, <coughs> the United States, if you will. Some scholars talk about soft balancing uh, versus hard balancing or non-confrontational balancing. So these are IR terms, and what it means essentially is that um, um, uh, Russia will sell China uh, uh, maybe its second tier military technology uh, to, uh, to, to help China uh, uh, achieve some objectives, but it won't sell the top tier technology because that will catch, uh, catch the attention of Washington. So all kinds of, there's a lot of game playing going on here, and there's a room, there's room obviously for a lot more um, um, research. Russia. Still a global player, despite what my reviewer um, was, was uh, arguing. And it has really rebounded since the late 1990s. And I, I was in Russia right before the crash in 1997, and it was very difficult times. But the country actually hit a depression, uh, uh, the economy, uh, and it has rebounded with, uh, in a fierce way, if you will. Vladimir Putin is young and healthy, uh, black belt in judo, right? I uh, like to be seen, or at least people like to see pictures of him bare-chested. Uh, he, he is what many Russians uh, uh, need, even if they don't like him, if you will. A strong, able leader, you know, contrasted with a Yeltsin who drank a bit, right? <laughs> contrasted with these others who died in office. Uh, 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 Putin, is, you know, to understand, appreciate Russian politics and culture. Uh, uh, um, you know, it, Putin is in a very, a, a very important signal here. Uh, simple, excuse me. Russia also, colleagues, uh, requires a multipolar world, and and, and uh, you know, one can say, well, this is what we want, but but the configuration of power may not speak that way. You know, U.S. is the only superpower, and even Russians and Chinese will agree to that. They'll, they'll, they will agree to that statement, but the 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 strategy. Of multipolarity means that you that you, you actively promote and push yourselves as power centers and others, if you will. So that's that's where they're coming from. Um, Russia insists on maintaining regional hegemony, and so those former Soviet republics, Russia insists on having uh, we call it spheres of influence. They call it uh, areas of of interest, natural interests, these uh, these kinds of things. And Russia insists on having, if you will, the trump card as regards energy. Um, um, uh, Russia is an energy superpower, having a lot of gas and oil, but it also insists on, on having a say over the flow of that oil, and the flow of that gas particularly. And that's a, we can talk further about this, but that's, a, that's the big deal about Ukraine, <coughs> excuse me, for many Westerners, is that that gas passes through Ukraine all the way to these EU countries. And so it's a, 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 it's a, it's a high-stakes game to, to continue and to ratchet up sanctions on Russian leaders. Sooner or later, energy becomes a card that the Russians will play. Good old USA, our interests and objectives. Still the only superpower, but many are rising. There is this rising rest that many talk about, or the emerging powers. Uh, um, uh, India. Um, um, it obviously is on the rise. And Brazil um, uh, uh, practices very, very, uh, in, in very, in a very focused way, being the champion of the third world, so to speak. Speaking to environmental issues, speaking to economic issues, and uh, speaking to issues uh, that the global south uh, is more concerned about. Uh, the Obviously, the USA, as we indicated, is it tends to be the odd man out in the, in the triangle. So Russia and China gang up on the USA almost automatically. And uh, there's really no real hopeful or positive access for the United States in the triangle today, if you will, and perhaps in the foreseeable future. Some Western scholars are lamenting this, and some are criticizing the overall US approach. That we that we we arrive at a point where we we conclude we don't need to be to play good old fashioned power politics. We don't need to roll up our sleeves and play political games because we are the superpower. We are this with the beacon on this on the hill, 
we don't need to stoop to power politics. Well, there are, there are both. This is a growing course of voices, again, in, in American IR, international relations scholarship, who are, who are um, have concluded, no, the, the time has passed for sitting above, you have to play politics. You've got you've to go get back to playing the Russians off against the Chinese and vice versa. Uh, um, um, that we, we have to enter the game again of great power politics. So, colleagues, the big three clash over nearly every issue, but at the core of it, um, um, uh, beyond the, 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 the divergent ideas and values and that kind of thing, that there's, it's real, there are really clashing visions about what uh, global politics should look like, and, 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 and international relations particularly. The um, Russians and Chinese and others insist on changing or transforming relationships, if you will, relationships among players. Whereas um, um, uh, on our side, the insistence is upon transforming actors. So the relationships will improve if the actors uh, go about things differently, even in human rights, even uh, in, in uh, trade uh, in these areas. But one thing that is very clear after the Cold War, as time goes by, is that regional competitions that involve, you know, two or all the big three, are intensifying, if you will. They are, they are intensifying. Um, I, I like to tell the story in my classes about the, um, uh, the confrontation in the Taiwan Strait in 1995-96. I won't tell it here. It's just that. The former president of Taiwan, who graduated from Cornell University, was given, you know, the uh, invitation to do the commencement. The State Department immediately gave him a visa. Okay, well, out of that commencement speech and the visa, you end up having uh, uh, Chinese leaders threatening to blow up San Francisco. Uh, uh, and so, and so, um, um, the 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 conflicts and the competition as they intensify. Uh, the, 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 the war of words and the, even at times the movement of military assets becomes part of the politics. That's an especially dangerous game in, a, in a, a crowded place like the Taiwan Strait or the Korean uh, uh, Peninsula. So there, there, um, uh, there is a, uh, there's an urgency for some uh, for these big three, if you will, to get it right. I, um, uh, in the, in the, uh, uh, with this framework, uh, looking at these different conflicts and regional uh, uh, problems, con conflagrations in some cases, I try to uh, kind of categorize them in rank order. We can, we can talk further. But after the Cold War, I've identified four broad regions, if you will, that, that, uh, that I label critical. Critical issues, critical situations, critical actors. First, there's MENA, or the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, um, uh, to, uh, those that, that I labeled critical <coughs> category issues are those that have a nuclear component, if you will. So at least a couple of the actors are nuclear powers or budding nuclear powers, if you will. And um, that in, in, all three of, in all of these four areas, there has been, or there's currently, there's ongoing violent uh, uh, confrontation. And in, in, in international relations, that's what we, we preach. Uh, if the violence hasn't started, don't let it start. If, it's, if it's, it's, it has ensued, get it stopped right away. In any event, in the Middle East and North Africa region, um, I designate the United States as still supreme, or supremacy, if you will, in that position. Russia struggles to maintain an authority status, and China is ascendant. And I think the Syria episode last year uh, showed us uh, that Russia still has a few cards to play. It was very important for Russian credibility and for obviously for Russian geostrategic uh, uh, the presence in, in the Middle East to not have the U.S. tussling with Syria. Uh, um, and so uh, the, the Middle East, U.S. Supreme, Russia has lost ground, but, but not totally. Asia Pacific. I think this is perhaps, you know, the, the, the top of the, in the top ten dangerous areas of the world. Uh, U.S. and China vie for supremacy in the Asian Pacific, and it's an intense competition. 
and of course Russia is an authority. And uh, I think one reason in, in this, this terrible situation with the Malaysian plane disappearing, going down, whatever, is that there is so much act military activity in this South East China Sea, Indian Ocean, this broad region, that, that there's a lot we don't know because the countries are just not reporting it simply because, uh, because of, of, of all this activity there. So Asia Pacific, U.S. and China vie for supremacy, and this is an intense uh, multifaceted competition. Russia maintains authority status. Central Asia, where the stands are, right? Russia is still supreme. Uh, China is an authority, and there's uh, where the Chinese and Russians compete most is in this part of the world, Central Asia. And the USA is ascendant, if you will. Finally, South Asia. Uh, perhaps this is the number one most dangerous uh, uh, part of the world in terms of the prospects of major power wars. I determined that all of my big three vie for authority status, if you will. They all compete for influence, play each other off and play off others in South Asia, and India is the ascendant power, if, if you will. Salient issues, and we can talk further about uh, um, some of these. Um, Ukraine, I put at the top of the list there. Uh, uh, South Caucasus, and so Georgia, if you will. Uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, and the United States is ascendant. So you have those in the White House here, and even in the U.S. Congress, that want Georgia and Ukraine in NATO and the European Union. And that's what a lot of this is, is about. Um, uh, and Russia uses its presence and influence uh, to uh, kind of set up a, a state of affairs where these two won't be fit for NATO and EU membership. Uh, 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 and, and so that's really what's at play here. Uh, they, the Russians see encroachment, encirclement, uh, um, um, we don't use these terms anymore, but they, they, that's what they see, that's what they perceive, and, uh, and they're using their presence, and again, their, 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 their heavy-handed presence, to, uh, uh, to make, it, make, make us think twice about allowing these actors to come into NATO and the EU. Uh, So-called latent issues, if you will. And, uh, and these could, some of these could become, I discussed in the book, uh, salient, or perhaps even more volatile than that. But there's uh, a lesser likelihood that we're going to fight and confront each other, the big three, over these. I list Turkey even though the Turkey's uh, internal divisions and schisms are, are pretty deep, and that's the place that some say could explode like Egypt, like Egypt has, or implode, if you will. The Mediterranean Sea region, and the different actors there. This whole WMD, or weapons of mass destruction thing, I like to point out to uh, folks at every opportunity that uh, missile defense is probably the number one issue besides NATO enlargement between the U.S. and Russia. Uh, and, that, and that's something that continues to aggravate the relationship, particularly the fact that uh, our country broke out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty uh, under George Bush. The Russians have never forgiven us um, um, uh, for that one. And, and, and this just, it, it, these things fuel the competition, rightly or wrongly. Energy security, and of course, cyber terror. So, um, uh, um, uh, the... Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the big concern regarding the latter cyber terror or the state sponsored or state complicity is um, uh, the extent to which uh, governments are actually involved. Uh, you know, the, the CNN likes to show its, its reporters driving in a car past one of these Chinese, uh, um, uh, in Shanghai, one of these Chinese installations, and they say that it's the military actually training the hackers. The military essentially there, uh, it runs Chinese hacking, if you will. A lot of hacking is, is, takes place out of, out of the former Soviet republics as well in Eastern Europe. And on our side too, of course, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, and so uh, the you know, people are wondering and speculating at what point does, uh, 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 does somebody uh, conclude that the response to a cyber attack uh, uh, is to be a military response. And a lot of scholarship hasn't even caught up on this yet. So, colleagues, in conclusion, um, there, 
there is something to the triangularity. Uh, way back in the 1970s, one observer um, um, uh, pointed out that these, meaning U.S., then Soviet and Chinese relationships and their interrelations are not random walks, as he called it. So they've been practicing this a long time. They, uh, um, and they meaning the, the big three, if you will. They're, they, they are very adept at this, if you will. Our country has chosen uh, um, not to play the game with just the three as the other two, Russia and China have. But they are very adept at this. But the, uh, uh, the concern from my study, and many who are looking at these issues, is as other actors, as, as the overall power calculus changes, as things evolve, as Iran evolves as a regional power, uh, um, um, you know, will these so-called rules of the game hold, if, if you will? Um, so, from different corners, and, uh, and in some cases, just based on the kinds of issues that the leaders tend to fight about, even verbally, um, I came up with this list of six uh, so-called policy recommendations. And believe me, most of these, they, would not even, they wouldn't even get past lower level functionaries in the State Department. You know, they, they wouldn't go anywhere. Uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, maybe go, it would take a garbage off to push something like this. Uh, transforming conflicts and not just keeping them uh, in, at play, in play, if you will. Um, uh, in these, these different conflict situations, they actually uh, will have constituencies. There's a constituency to keep NATO around. Okay. Um, uh, there, and so there actually are, and many say, yeah, ah, the military-industrial complex, but there are constituencies, if, if you will. There, in other words, there are reasons that are legit, from a political standpoint, to keep the two Chinese, uh, uh, two Chinas apart, if you will. There, uh, there, are, there are reasons um, uh, for China uh, to keep uh, providing fuel and food to North Korea. North, uh, North Korea serves certain strategic purposes for uh, China. And so, uh, and that's the history of politics. Uh, they, they relate the interrelationships. Um, uh, I call for these to be transformed uh, so that, uh, you know, when there's a NATO summit here in this country that Vladimir Putin comes, we agree, and he agrees to come, we agree to go to, to, to summits in, in that part of the world. Uh, whatever it is. Um, uh, but in any event, there's a lot of work to be done for transforming these relationships. The level of distrust, of enmity, of uh, just bad rhetoric uh, um, is really, really strong. I won't plow through all of these, uh, but um, uh, UN Security Council reform. Uh, that is way past due, if, if you will. Now, China signaled its displeasure <coughs> with the Ukraine dismemberment by abstaining um, um, in, this, in this vote uh, uh, in response to this referendum in Ukraine. But um, um, and council reform, the, they have to vote, right, the five in the council, the permanent powers, to even reform the council. Uh, and so we have in place with the Security Council mechanism and, and that permanent five contingent, something that's been there since the beginning of 1945. This really, really uh, limits cooperation on a number of issues um, in the um, international uh, political economy, particularly. Lastly, this is the last one. We came pretty close to disaster uh, in 19, uh, 2007 eight, right, with the Great Recession. Uh, we were really on the brink of, of a depression. Uh, and um, um, the, in fact, the G20, the group of 20, is in place to have a global discussion and hopefully global cooperation to forestall uh, uh, another recession like 2008 and even worse, a depression, if you will. Um, uh, uh, many of the problems with the U.S. and China relationship has to do with currency and trade. Um, uh, but we speculate on how far either side would go to pursue a fight 
in the financial or economic realm. Um, uh, you know, but again, we, we speculate. We're, we're not sure. And we're not sure if uh, something erupted in the South China Sea or Ty Taiwan Strait, that someone either in Washington or Beijing gets the idea, well, let's, let's, let's turn up a little heat in the economic or financial realm. Uh, that could be disastrous globally. If, if, a, if a conflict went, went uh, in, in that direction. So, uh, um, uh, triangularity, triangle, triangular politics. I don't argue in the project that we have achieved a tripolar system, if you will. Uh, and my critics you know, were waiting, and I, so I was very careful in this, and I talk about in the book how we, this is a, 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 a politics, a state of affairs, um, uh, where the three can can fight each other, okay, uh, uh, oppose each other, and cooperate with each other, it, it's all interest driven, if, if, if you will. This has not uh, become a system. Uh, uh, um, some observers argue that perhaps we're on our way to a so-called multipolar system. Some argue that no, we're headed towards a non-polar world. Richard House is one prominent observer that argues that's where we're headed. Some argue um, that there will be hybrid type setups or systems, if, if, if you will, where maybe you're, you're an economic superpower in one, one realm, a military superpower in another. So there are all kinds of debates in international relations about where we are and, and where we're headed. But this, again, this triangle has persisted, it has evolved, and um, uh, and you can you'll see some of the, the quotes I used at the beginning of the chapters. Uh, the leaders think about triangularity and they and they practice it in a very conscious way. Okay, well, um, if anyone would like to uh, um, um, have some discussion questions, uh, I guess we're kind of open enough. Well, then just one statement. You close by stating that um, that this is not. You made it clear this is not a system. This is simply a process. Yeah. And your counter, your, the, the counter arguments is that possibly that this is a system. Is that what you're saying? You're yeah. Saying that? I, I don't think it's a system yet. It, it, uh, and and the, in international relations, and so much of this needs to, uh, you know, so much of the, of the, the, the study that I did as an undergraduate and graduate, it, it's really, it, it's really um, out of date now. Uh, because it was it, uh, it, the, the 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 research didn't factor in a Brazil or in an Iran or North Korea that uh, for all of its weaknesses really is a regional power, and and so um, 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 you know um, to uh, to to have if you will a tripolar system, okay, uh, three three centers of power, and some argue that it, this act the tri uh, we actually uh, achieved tripolarity in the mid. 70s about that time. Some argue. In fact, one uh, prominent uh, deceased British strategist, Hedley Bull, uh, argued that in the 1970s, China was already a great power. This is before the reforms that would come after uh, Mao Zedong. So uh, um, uh, we, we, we fight incessantly in, in the social sciences and history, uh, particularly what makes a great power or a superpower, if you will. Uh, uh, and so my, my critic, my, the blind reviewer, you know, he, he, he had a point there. You know, Russia, it, it, it's really diminished, uh, but the power that it has uh, um, uh, gives it prestige and influence beyond what we count and weigh, okay, what we call power. So I may, I, I may be wrong. We, it may actually be tripolarity. Maybe I'm a bit humble uh, or beat up by some of the criticisms, but um, um, at the same time, you have uh, India, Pakistan, you have other actors. Well, that's where yeah. I was going with India yeah. specifically. Yeah. That was just your statement when you were indicating that this is not necessarily a system. It's sort of, with your critic a little bit because I can feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it, 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 it looked, when things are happening, they're evolving, and they're constant, um, they then become policy. They become that's system. Right. Yeah. So how then do you frame them in order to not state that's what they are? So that's my counter sure. to your statement when you stated your work that you're showing. It appears to me that you're clearly showing this is how this system is now and evolving too when you talk about traditional powers, you talk about 
So that, that was just, uh, and I, I just I, heard your statement when you were voting. And I appreciate that. And, and, and some of my colleagues, you know, and we all do this for each other. We read the and, and, and the manuscript, and they would call me and email me, and they would correct me. They said, you, you need to be more forceful here, or you need to use better words there, that sort of thing. Some call it a system. One colleague calls it tripolarity. He refuses to use, you know, this this is more elaborate term that I came up with. Uh, uh, that that's that's how he sees it. That there, at, at a minimum, there is a regularity, yeah. uh, and and they really do uh, are, are tuned to uh, each other. Uh, um, and so uh, the the policy making in, in D.C. Uh, uh, towards China uh, uh, tries to second guess. Well, how will the Russians respond to this? Uh, and, and, and the leaders speak to this. We don't have to guess about a lot of this. I would be interested to know when you were writing this, where, where, or when you were, and how things have changed up till now in places like Syria and Ukraine <laughs> and Iran and all those places. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you would go back and change, or has it cemented some of the ideas that well, you had? That's a great question. What I what I would spend more time on, uh, and, and, and and of course you, you don't have a luxury of time. You're right. doing this and a million other things. I would spend more time looking at sub-regional and regional dynamics in that way. I would look. I, I would pay more attention to some of the. You know, I talked about my big three, and then those that are in the orbit. I would spend more time talking about actors that are that uh, uh, like you cannot talk about Iran without talking about Israel or Saudi Arabia. I would spend more time looking at others from among those regional or those aspiring you know, uh, powers in, in, in the regions. I would have spent more time, uh, uh, you know, and, and in the case of Ukraine, provided more history of, 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 of you know, how, how, how we got to where we are now with uh, Ukraine. Uh, and so more, if you will, of that of a sort of the sub-regional, the, the regional bit of it, and perhaps even for Ukraine, the, the, the domestic politics, because a lot of this is 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 you know, it's, a, it's a fight within the borders, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Hall, this is a general current affairs question. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering why Russia took away Crimea from the Ukraine. Ah. Is it because of oil, or what do you think is the reason behind? It's it's the, it's 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 two. It's a two pronged thing, Mr. Hall. It's domestic politics. Okay. So it's the. It's, and you notice we're, we're having back and forth, and you even have international lawyers on TV, the pundits, they're going back and forth. It was an act of aggression. Uh, it may not be, but, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is the new government legitimate? Uh, and so the, 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 the first part of this, Mr. Ola, it's domestic politics, meaning Ukrainian politics, that, um, um, uh, that, that the, the balance of power <coughs> internally tilted, in a way, against Russian interests. It tilted to the West. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, the, the Baltics were let go, right? Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the outer empire, uh, 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 Poland, Hungary, Hungary, these places. But there is an inner empire. Uh, and, and, and the Russians use this term all the time. And what they, what they mean is that that's our space. Even if they're now free and sovereign, they're still ours. Uh, uh, or at least they're in our interest because what our people are there. We built them. And so part of the, the Russian design is, is, is certain, certain ones are not going to be allowed to tilt to the West. Because that's, that's the opportunity for the EU and NATO to sign these agreements, uh, 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 and then they can get on the road to membership. So that's the other part of it, sir, is that the, the domestic politics tilted in a, in a way uh, inimical to Russian interests, and, and, and then, of course, the, the regional players. Now, uh, uh, I think, in part, in uh, 2008, the war in Georgia, the Georgians were baited into the war. Uh, uh, and and the, the, the Ukrainians were smarter, if you will. They, 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 they were not going to throw a rock at Russia, even if Russia threw the first rock. But that wasn't the case in 2008 with Georgia. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, 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 but this is, what, what we see with the, again, this is Russia's fear. Uh, and going back to the establishment of the USSR and to the, the, the end of World War II, Dr. Knight, his story, he appreciates this, Russia established a, uh, a, a geopolitical presence. 
so that if you're going to, uh, meaning if uh, we, the, the West, we're going to have our way there, then you're going to have to fight to have, have your way. Um, and so the Russian diaspora's there, sympathetic Ukrainians, right, are there. And at the end of the day, and, and the Russians keep reminding us, at least the nationalists, Crimea really is Russia. It, it, you know, it, and it was a mistake of Nikita Khrushchev in the 50s to, to give away a piece of Russian territory. Uh, now, uh, international law says, well, you're, you're belong to another state now. Well, but the people have voted, right, to go back home. <laughs> for, for, for. Yeah, but I um, appreciate your presentation. Um, you said that China needs a multipolar world. Um, could you explain that sure. a little bit more? Or, or yeah. Explain as to well, why they need it more than, let's say, the United States needs a multipolar world? Because, because, uh, because of the kind of politics that China, Russia, even India, and at times France, there, there, are, there's a course of voices who who argue that a more stable, a calmer, more peaceful world order is one where there are multiple centers of power, and so you have multiple, you have different cultures that uh, uh, that that everybody everybody respects. So there's maybe an Islamic power center or. Of Islamic power centers in the plural, but that uh, that um, uh, that that the world is calmer, more stable, and there's less of this intense competition if there are if multiple centers of power are respected, and if if if, if powers are allowed to emerge, if you will. And so even uh, Matt Kronick uh, wrote a very uh, provocative essay in Foreign Affairs. It basically said, "Look, let Iran be a nuclear power." What's, what's the big deal? You know, they're not stupid enough to, to, to do something with a new, you know, first. And there are even those that argued that after the Cold War, what's wrong with a nuclear Germany? It'd be a great balance against Russia. And so uh, uh, many argue that multiple centers of power, you know, economic, financial, military, political, that that's a better world. And then they look at, uh, um, at us, the, the U.S. and the West, and argue that you're, you're hegemonistic. And, that, and not only um, um, uh, do you want to maintain all this power, uh, you don't want us to get into the club. You'll fight us, uh, uh, and particularly if we're not coming to the club on, on, your, on your terms. And so, um, um, can, uh, you know, China lives with a nuclear North Korea, however small and weak the force is. Russia lives with a nuclear North Korea. They, they'll, 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 they, they will live with uh, Bashar Assad, Al Assad in, in Syria, uh, uh, and, and you know, and 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 they and they prefer on any given day Russian and Chinese leaders not to speak to domestic issues and human rights and these things. That's the pragmatism, and and their counter is the U.S. spends too much time uh, on values and principles, and they say you don't adhere to them anyway. But that uh, let's leave these things out of foreign policy in our in our relationships. Uh, and, and, and that the world has to evolve into a, a multi-centered, so whatever it is, it, it can't stay one or two uh, blocks, if, if you will. And so China and Russia, they, they not only do they speak this, they actively promote it. And, 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 they, and their policies, you know, of course, they balance off each other in the triangle, but they balance with others. And, and so um, uh, Russia, Props of India, just to kind of keep China on on, on guard too. And so, it, it, you know, some of these observers talk about multiple triangles or, or multiple centers. Just last question, because I'd be interested to see your continued work regarding the Middle East and North Africa, mm. and whereas you have the U.S. Supreme. We also understand the role that the other two percent perceived with what China is doing there. Sure. So. And I don't know about it. I'm sure Clark and Spelman too. China and Africa. I mean that. Yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's where that your work is what I can really see it's because we're looking mm -hmm. at the link between what it is you're looking at from the standpoint of these mm -hmm. superpowers. But sure. in essence, um, this triangle that you're talking mm -hmm. about is evolving to something different. And how does yes. Africa come into play? Oh. What is that role? So that's part of it. Um, 
the next steps, I see the, the next, next book. And, and thank you, yeah. and, 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 you know, I, I became preoccupied with the triangle yeah. because of preoccupation with the Korean Peninsula back in the early and mid-90s. Now I'm preoccupied with the whole Indian Ocean region. And it's, it's something, uh, people call that a, re, a super region now that pulls together the Middle East, right, East Asia, and, and, and Africa. Uh, uh, and, and it's something my big three are all hard at work with their submarines and their, and their naval and their air forces in this whole Indian Ocean uh, uh, region. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, that, that, that's the next work. <laughs> well, colleagues, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh,